Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I wanted to talk to you about attitudes while I was here this weekend because I think our attitude is one of the most important things in our life. As I said last night, you can have really great circumstances, and if you have a lousy attitude, you're still going to be miserable. But you can have bad circumstances and have a good attitude, and somehow or another you can be a happy person that just makes it through whatever. So last night I talked about having a merciful and a forgiving attitude, and I know that we all have had opportunity to practice already just since last night. This morning in the first service I talked about having a confident attitude and now I want to talk to you about an attitude that I think is really a very dangerous one and it's really dangerous because the people who have it don't know that they have it. So I'm hoping if you're one of the ones here today who have it that what I have to say will help you and if you don't have it I pray that you never get it and it's a religious attitude. An attitude that I believe God absolutely despises. A religious attitude makes you look at your good works and think that you are so much better than all the miserable sinners. Let's look at Luke 15. Father, thank you this morning for your word. God, we pray that it would set us free and keep us free. If anybody has a bad attitude, help them get over it. And if they don't have one, help them not to get one. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning in verse 1, Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and the notorious, especially wicked sinners, were all coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious folks, kept muttering, and indignantly complaining, saying, This man accepts and receives and welcomes preeminently wicked sinners, and he even eats with them. Now you see, Jesus came for sinners. He's a physician for our soul, and he came for those that were sick and needy. But the religious people would have actually kept the sinners away from him. Because they saw themselves so much better than everybody else that they would not even try to help those that needed help. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paul Scanlon here or not, but he's a minister in England that uh, tells some wonderful stories about he, how he crossed his church over from being a, a dead, dry, religious mausoleum into an on-fire, amazing outreach church that is now helping literally millions of people worldwide. And he said it was the most difficult thing that he ever tried to do because although we sit and pray for revival, we really don't want one. We think we want one, but we somehow like the idea of praying for one better than we would like one if we got one because if we get revival, all the people that come in are not going to be nice and cleaned up and fixed up like we think we are. They're going to be messy and some of them may not dress right and they may not act right and they may not talk right. and They might not be somebody that all of us upright folks would like to hang out with. However, Jesus likes them very much and he'd like them to be a whole lot more welcome in the church, not to sit in some section by themselves for those people, but to sit amongst us and with us because, as I said in the first service this morning, in Christ there is no class distinction. We have to understand that, that as Christians we have no right to exclude anybody. We cannot exclude people. Jesus did not exclude people. He included everybody, and we need to broaden our circle of inclusion. There's no reason why the wealthy can't hang out with the poor and the single can't be with the married. And Of course, we know that all colors can be together and we're all one in Christ. No more male nor female, no more Jew nor Greek, no more slave nor free, and we could take it and go on and on and on. No upper class, middle class, lower class. 
We're nothing without him, and anything that we are is in him. And Paul tells some of the funny stories about different things, but one in particular I remember was about a woman that they bust into the church who was a pretty rough character. She'd been on the streets for a long time and, I mean, came with tattoos and bad language and no manners and the whole thing. Well, she'd never really felt the presence of God, and one day as they were worshiping the presence of God, the power of God swept through the, the congregation, and some people were even kind of falling out under the power of God, and all of a sudden she rips out, what the blankety blank blank was that? <laughs> well, of course, everybody was just like, oh! The next week, she comes back again, and he's offering to pray for people at the altar, and here she comes down the aisle, and he's thinking, oh, no. <laughs> sure enough, he goes to pray for her, and she starts to fall out under the power of God, and she says, oh, there the blankety-blank thing is again. <laughs> but any Christian that's got half a brain, if you're a real Christian and you've got half a brain and any kind of a heart and a right attitude at all, you just look over something like that because you know where that person is at and you want to see them get to where they need to be. Amen? So if we're going to have revival, I think it needs to start with us having a better, better attitude about including everybody and not excluding anybody. If anything, we should go out of our way to talk to the person that appears to be the least and the loneliest and the one who has nobody with them or the one who maybe looks like they're a little bit out of the ordinary from all the rest of us. One of the things that my husband does that I think is, is really beautiful is he will spend a lot of time talking to somebody, maybe even in a coffee shop or something that pretty obvious that nobody else maybe would want to talk to. And those are the things that really cause God to anoint you in your public life. It's how you act behind closed doors that determines what kind of an anointing and what kind of power of God you're going to have on your life in public. I know you guys have had Christine Kane here, and you know, Chris is a good friend of mine and a tremendous woman of God, and she is at heart an evangelist, where I am a teacher. Now, we both love to see people get saved, but I have a real focus on people growing up in God. Reinhard Bonnke is a real evangelist, and I tell him, you catch them, throw them to me, and I'll clean them. <laughs> and Christine is a real evangelist at heart. Well, one day her and I were shopping in uh, Arizona. We were together out there. She'd come to one of my conferences, I think, and we were in a little shop, and the girl there started asking us what, you know, were we visiting, what were we there for, so on and so forth. And so Chris said, well, we're here for a conference, you know, Joyce, the Bible teacher on TV. And I said, Chris, the minister. And the lady says, oh, I'm spiritual. Well, you know, as soon as somebody tells me that, it kind of spooks me because I think, well, you didn't say you're a Christian, so what do you mean you're spiritual? Because that could be anything from, you know, I'm a psychic to no telling what. So we're kind of trying to, you know, ease into the, conversation and she's using a lot of bad language well I am really sensitive to bad language because my father cussed really 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 bad when I was growing up and I just absolutely got to the point where I just despised it so this girl's doing a lot of healthy cussing including using the one word that we would all probably hate the worst so I'm getting a little more knotted up inside all the time and then she starts to apologize for using bad language and she said but you know what she said, I think God understands. She said, I think God probably even cusses once in a while. <laughs> well, I leaned over that counter, and I said, honey, God does not cuss. Now, right now, I'm all, whatever religiosity I've got left in me, it came to the forefront, and I am now going to defend God's honor. I said, God does not cuss. But Christine came right in over here and she said, but he loves people that do. <laughs> and I thought, there, I've done it again. I was trying to clean, him or clean her and we hadn't even caught her yet. 
So we're going to have to be a little more tolerant of people that are not like us and make sure that we're not excluding people because way, way, way in the back of our minds, even though we would never say it and we wouldn't even want to admit it to ourselves, we think we're just a little bit better. I'm going to find somebody that's talking to me because you guys ain't. Just a, just a little bit better. So when Jesus saw how the Pharisees, the religious people acted, and by the way, when people act like this, they have religion without relationship. When you have religion, but you have a deep relationship with Jesus, then you don't act like that because the more you hang out with Jesus, the more he softens your heart and tenderizes your heart, and the more you come by, become like him. But if you just go to church and follow rules and regulations and go through the motions, you can have religion and be so proud of yourself because you have religion, and yet just really be a jerk. So Jesus goes on to tell them a parable that you're all familiar with, the story of the prodigal son. But really the story, I think, is much more about the elder brother than it is the prodigal son. I think, to be honest, that we miss probably, they're both very important lessons. The story about the prodigal is a very important lesson. It's a great lesson about how he left and lived in deep sin, and when he came back, his father was waiting already with open arms and wanted to just give, 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 give to him. We see the heart of God there. But the thing that I haven't heard preached about as much that I think is extremely important is how the elder brother responded to that. We have the sinner and the religious person. And I believe that God wants to teach us a lesson from this parable. So we're going to start in verse 11. It goes all the way through verse 32. I won't try to read the whole thing. I'll skip around a little bit and hopefully I can help you keep up with me. And he said, there was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. Now, if you don't mind writing in your Bible and you've got a pen in your hand, you should draw a circle around give me. Because give me, Father, give me, give me, Father, give me is the first sign of spiritual immaturity. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. We all start out that way, by the way. Give me the part of the property that belongs to me, and he divided his estate between them. I want you to notice that even though the father knew it was not the best thing for him, he gave it to him anyway because he knew the boy was never going to learn by him telling him he had to let him find out for himself. And not many days after that, the young son gathered up all that he had, and he journeyed into a distant country, and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. The word prodigal, we call him the prodigal son, means reckless, extravagant, and wasteful. You know, this boy's son was crashingly obvious. Nobody has to wonder, is he a sinner or not? Nobody has to wonder what his sin was. It was right out there in the open. He knew he was a sinner, and everybody else knew that he was a sinner. And you know what happened? There came a famine in the land. He'd spent all of his money. He ended up going to work for a pig farmer and had nothing to eat but the same thing the pigs were eating. And then the Bible says in the midst of that, he came to himself. He had an epiphany. He woke up. It's amazing what a crisis will do for us in our lives. I love Andrew Murray's books, and I'm reading one of his books again right now and he he talks about how people will just kind of go along and be kind of religious and but not really have the power of the holy spirit in their life they're not you know they're they're going to church they're doing their little thing but they don't really have the power of the holy spirit they haven't really surrendered themselves fully so they can have the power of the holy spirit in their life to really help them live the way they ought to live we can't live the way that we should live we cannot be merciful and forgiving we can't be loving. We can't be kind unless the power of the Holy Spirit 
is flowing through us every day. We might be able to squeeze out a little bit of that here and there. But it won't be for the right reason. And it'll never be consistent. He said people will just go along in their little religious boat. But then when they have a crisis. Very often it's that crisis that will make people really fully surrender to God and really consecrate themselves to God and just say, just a little bit is not going to do it. I've got to have all. I've got to have all of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I have to have more of the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. <laughs> Verse 17 says, when he came to himself, he said, well, the hired servants of my father live better than I'm living. <laughs> I'm dying of hunger. I'm going to get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I want you to look particularly at verse 19 because I love this. You're getting ready to draw a circle around two more words. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but now just make me. He starts out with, give me. And after a trip to the pig pen, <laughs> now he's getting it right. Make me. Over here, give me what I want. Give me what I want. Give me what I want. Give it to me now. Give it to me now. I want to do what I want to do. Now over here, he's, make me one of your servants. Make me what you want me to be, God. If you need to get from give me to make me, today is a good opportunity for you. Because as long as you stay on the give me side, you're never going to be fulfilled. But if you get to make me what you want me to be, and I don't even care what it is, God, because see, it doesn't matter what your position is in the world or what your position is even in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you're the worship leader or in the choir. It doesn't matter if you're Joel or the brother. It doesn't matter if you're Joyce or somebody else. See, it doesn't matter. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it doesn't matter as long as you're doing what God wants you to do. That's the part that's important. Everybody wonders about Dave. So how does Dave handle this thing with you? You know how Dave handles it? Because he's long past give me, and years ago he got to make me what you want me to be. And it was a little hard for Dave in the very beginning when he saw that God had called me to preach and that he didn't have that gift. Because it was a lot more unique even then for women to be doing this than it is now. It was very unique 35 years ago. Very unique. You could count on one hand the number of women that were doing this. And only a couple really publicly. But Dave is one of the greatest men of God that I know. Because he simply finally saw, and it only took just a few weeks. I mean, just a few weeks. I mean, I remember Dave said, I don't want to be in ministry. That's not what I want to do. And so I went back to God. And, went, and the Lord just said, you do what I'm telling you to. And just don't worry about the rest of it. He, Dave wasn't telling me I couldn't do it. He was just saying that's not what he wanted to do. And only three weeks went by and he came back and he said, you know, God has shown me that he's anointed you for this. And so I just want you to know that I'm with you, whatever it is, you know. God wants to do through you. I'm with you. And he has stood with me and stood by me and sat there and listened to me and listened to me. And Dave's got his own gifts, his own talents. Dave has managed the money in this ministry so well, it is unbelievable. We have never paid a penny in interest. Never. Not one penny have we ever paid in interest. Everything the ministry has is paid for. And I'm not saying that as a bragging point. I'm not saying it's wrong if, you know, people borrow money. But I'm just saying that he has a gift in that area. He lets me be who I am, and I let him be who he is because we've both said, make me. I'm sure that part of the reason why everything works out so beautifully here in the Osteen family is because they've all said, God, you make me what you want me to be. And every one of you need to say that today. God, make me 
what you want me to be. Not give me this and give me that and I want to be this and I want to do that and I want this and I want that and if you don't give it to me then you don't love me as much as you love somebody else. No, what God wants to hear is God, here I am, you make me what you want me to be and no matter what I'm asking you for, if it's not right, God, don't give it to me. Amen? Because I will tell you the last thing in the world you want is to be in a position that God has not anointed you to be in. You talk about a nightmare. That is a nightmare. Trying to do something that there is no grace on you to do. I don't have a hard time doing this because I'm gifted for it. I can stand here and talk for the next four or five hours and be totally fine. I have no idea what's coming out of my mouth next, but it doesn't matter because I know God's with me and I know it'll make sense and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But you sure wouldn't want me to operate on you like Dr. Paul does when he goes. <laughs> you wouldn't want to watch me sing. I, I always clap off beat than everybody else. I do. Dave will go. And when I'm clapping in praise and worship, I have to look at other people and try to <laughs> catch up with them. Although I don't know why I do it, but however they're clapping, I'm the totally off beat. I guess I'm just one of those out there people that's always going to do it a little bit different. I don't know. Oh, God is so good. So that's my little message on getting from give me to make me. Come on, if you're in here today and you've got a sibling you're jealous of, you've got a brother or a sister that you think has outshined you, they seem to have more talent than you, they have more money than you, mom and dad seems to favor them more, on and on and on and on. Why don't you just get over it? <laughs> well, it's not fair, and it's not this, and it's not that, is it? We don't understand why God does what he does. Nor do we understand what people are going through on the inside. No matter what it looks like on the outside. People can have everything that you think that you want, and that doesn't mean they're happy with it. My husband is one of the happiest, most content, most stable people that I have ever seen in my life. And it is largely because he knows what he is anointed for and what he's not, and he doesn't try to live outside of the grace of God on his life. Amen? Amen. The younger brother's sin was crashingly obvious. But the elder brother was lost. Just as lost as the younger brother. We have two kinds of lostness here. One was lost in his sin. The other one was lost in his righteousness. I didn't say he was lost in God's righteousness. He was lost in his own righteousness. He was lost in his self-righteous religious attitude. He was lost in his good works. The minute that we begin to judge somebody else critically or look down on them, we know that we need an attitude adjustment. One man said that he sent his wife to my meetings every week to get an attitude adjustment. <laughs> How many of you could use a little attitude adjustment? This morning. Well, if you, I mean, if you don't, I'll just preach to myself. I, I mean, I'm glad that God has called me to preach because this keeps me straight. I need it. The older son was blind to his condition. And I want you to hear this part in particular. The attitude that the elder brother had was a very dangerous and a deceptive attitude that alienated him from his father. When we have this religious attitude, that we think we're so good and we're above other people because we're doing more right than they are. When the Bible really tells us to pray for them and have mercy and sympathy for them and to be concerned for their spiritual well-being. That kind of an attitude alienates us from the Father. And we can't really come into His presence like He wants us to. You know, there are times when we have a bad attitude and it causes us to mistreat other people. But as we totally surrender to God, we can learn to develop the same compassion, patience, and humility 
that our Lord and Savior has for us. We are here in Tanzania, and we're in the middle of Tanzania in a land where the Datoga people live. And my first visit here was over a year ago, and the conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water. People would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education. And so we started planning and, and asking, how can we make a difference in this? And so today, we're here, and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells. They're solar paneled with pumps, and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters, and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania, and we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful. The people are so appreciative. And we say thank you, and God bless you.